Uh, yeah, and the um, opportunity to present a talk. Uh, since um, this is uh, the first meeting this year, I wish all of you a happy and hopefully soon more peaceful um, new year. Um, my talk is based on joint work with Aristophanes uh, de Marcus, who um, sadly passed away in uh, uh, 2021. Um, first, um, I will give a, well, okay, this doesn't work. Let me see. I have to go to the next. Ah, um, sorry. I have to go to the presentation. Good. So uh, here's the contents of uh, my talk. Uh, first, I will give a brief introduction to Haye Bruha orders, which were introduced by Marlin and Schechtmann in 1986. <clears throat> um, Yuri Marlin uh, died on the 7th of January this year at the age of 85. Um, he was, in, uh, um, uh, from my view, a really outstanding mathematician and mathematical physicist. Uh, born um, on the Crimea, and he held Russian as well as German citizenship. My, my talk uh, may also be a small tribute, an homage to him. Um, then I will um, discuss simplex equations, which essentially are nothing but a subsequence of these higher Bruja orders. The B31 corresponds to the apex equation. Um, then I will um, show you how to derive from the Hayabriha orders what we called Tamari orders. We introduced them in 2012. Um, recently, they were shown to be equivalent to Hayestashev Tamari orders, uh, which have been uh, introduced um, long ago by. Uh, <clears throat> Kapranov, Wawatsky, Edelman, and Reiner. Um, with, these, with the subsequence of these Tamari orders, um, yeah, um, uh, associated is, sorry, is a set of um, equations which we called the polygon equations. And these uh, generalize the well known pentagon equation. Uh, finally, I will. Um, report on some related results. So first, let me recall what a Bruja order is. Um, this is a partial order on the set of numbers from one to n induced by transposition. So um, we start with a lexicographical order on the set of numbers from one to big N and apply transpositions until we end up with a reverse lexicographical order of these numbers. If n is greater than two, there are several ways of doing it. And um, all these um, maximal chains of obtained in this way form a partially ordered set, a post set, which has a unique highest and a unique lowest element, which are these two guys here. Um, here are two examples, B31. So in this case, we are dealing with a set of numbers one, two, three, and one component subsets. Um, uh, so the upper, um, the highest vertex here is the lexicographical order one, two, three. The lowest vertex is the reversed order three, two, one. And assigned to the edges are doublets of numbers, and they indicate transpositions inversions. Well, if we add in um, a further numbers, so now we consider the numbers one, two, three, four, and um, we yeah, consider permutations of um, this set of four numbers. Uh, then again, the highest vertex here is the lexicographical order one, two, three, four. Uh, the lower lowest vertex is the reversed lexicographical order. 
This forms a polyhedron in three dimension, which is known as the permutohedron. Now, uh, how is um, the Bruhan order B31 related to the young Bexley equation? Well, I just showed you, this is a hexagon. So there are two maximum chains leading from the lexicographical order one, two, three to the reverse lexicographical order. Now these change, chains are displayed again here. Yeah? And uh, over the arrows, we have a set of two numbers, one and two. Mm -hmm. This uh, should be the set of the corresponding numbers, one, one and two. And, and this indicates in a transposition. So here we transpose the numbers one and two. So it gives two and, uh, two and one, and then one and three are exchanged and so on. Yeah. Uh, now we consider set theoretical realization of the structure to any number we assign a set. Uh, to a tuple of numbers, we assign the direct product of the corresponding spaces or sets here. Uh, to a, a doublet, which appears here over an arrow, we assign a map which acts on ui times uj to the maps to the reversed um, direct product of sets. Uh, we can also consider a realization using vector spaces and tensor products or direct uh, sums. Now, um, if we uh, follow these two chains, we get the left and the right hand side um, of an equation. So here, first we apply a map R12. This is this guy here. Then follows a map uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 3. This is this guy. And finally, a map R23, which is this guy. So this should be read as a composition of maps. From the second chain, we obtain this order of maps are. And this is the young baxter equation. If we introduce additional, well, at this point, somehow redundant indices, these are the bold phase fat indices here, um, then uh, we can, um, uh, here we have a different, different description by saying that a map X on a direct a product of spaces at positions one and two, or at positions two and three, and the like. No? At this point, we could drop the combinatorial indices coming from the Bruja order and simply retain only the fat indices. And we are led then to this form of the young Bexter equation, which which is one of the most well-known forms in which it appears in the literature. Alternatively, we can take the composition of the map R with the permutation and um, get this form of the, uh, of the equation, uh, where um, simply now the position indices have changed. Uh, changed. And uh, if we drop again the combinatorial indices, we are led to this form of the young Baxter equation. And this is the second um, familiar form in which it appears in the literature. Okay, I guess this is something um, you are familiar with. Now we come to higher Bruja orders. Again, we consider as a basic set, the set of numbers from one to big N. But now we do not consider one element subset, but small n element subsets. And uh, we consider an ordering on this, um, on, um, yeah, here we consider an order on this set. So we consider the set of small n element subsets of this basic set of numbers. Um, then we can start with a lexicographical order and perform operations to finally end up with a reverse lexicographical order of the set. The inversion is um, applies to a set of 
um, n element subsets of this set here, uh, which involves small n plus one elements. I will give you examples um, uh, in a moment. Um, so at this point, um, this may not be easy to understand, um, but the idea is simply again, as before, you start from a lexical, a lexicographical order of a set and you uh, imply inversions, which have been tra transpositions in the previous case, the weak Buriha order case, um, to finally end up with a reverse lexicographical order of the set. There are in general several ways of doing this and the um, sequences of inversions uh, then forms a partially ordered set, a bow set, again with a unique highest, this one here, and a unique lowest element. The simplest case is B32. Here we are dealing with the numbers one, two, three, and two element subsets. So one, two here stands for the set of elements one and two. Um, this is a very simple thing because there's only one possible inversion. Here is the lexicographical order of the set, and here is the reverse order. And well, there is a map um, which um, stands for this inversion. Um, the first thing to note is that here we are no longer dealing with all permutations of the set. Of course, there are other permutations of these guys here, like one, two, two, three, one, three, and so on. They are not admissible uh, simply because they cannot be reached by such an inversion uh, from, uh, from the lexicographical order. Um, so here is an appearance of this kind of structure. Take phases, so functions which um, depend linearly on x and, x and y with real constants. Um, then a coincidence of such, uh, of two phases determines a straight line in the plane, uh, which is the region, um, which is, uh, which separates the region where theta i is greater than theta j or theta j is greater than the, uh, theta i. Uh, for m equal to three, this is displayed in this figure. We have um, boundary, uh, three boundary lines between phases. Here, one, two, for example, is um, the coincidence of theta uh, of the phase theta one with theta two. If you look at the bottom, you see a lexicographical order of ingoing lines. If you consider this as a process in y direction, in vertical direction, you end up with a reverse lexicographical order here, two, three, one, three, one, two. And the whole process uh, goes via a point where all the three phases coincide. So theta one equal to theta two equal to theta three. And this should uh, be um, related to this set one, two, three here. So, uh, uh, this realizes the Bruja order as a process. And this is a structure we actually beat when we deal with certain soliton solutions of the KP equation. I will uh, tell you a bit more about this later on. Higher Bruja uh, orders are still a little bit more complicated. Here is B42. So we are dealing with the numbers one, two, three, four, and two element subsets. So here is the lexicographical order of this set. One, two, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four, and so on, and so on. Um, the, uh, here are two elements, one, four, two, three. They have no, no number in common, so they are somewhat independent, and we allow them to get permuted. So here we have an equivalence relation uh, we can simply exchange these, uh, these two guys. And so that now here is a packet, one, two, one, three, two, three. This is the packet of the set one, two, three. 
um, to which we can apply now in inversion. So these two, uh, these three guys are inverted to two, three, one, three, one, two. Um, in the next step, we see that here we have uh, three neighboring guys, which are lexicographically ordered. One, two, one, four, two, one, four. This is the packet of the set one, two, four. Um, uh, yeah, well, so we can apply again an inversion, you know, which takes this to two, four, one, four, one, two. Uh, next, we can apply two permutations. These two guys have nothing in common, so we, we can commute them. These two guys also have nothing in common, we can commute them. Uh, so again, uh, this achieves that here three elements are in row, uh, and this is the packet of the set one, three, four, no? because this set um, uh, can be, well, it uh, has as, uh, um, uh, two element uh, subsets, um, these three guys. Here. And in the last step, we can apply an inversion to these three numbers. So uh, here you see how, in which way, um, the previous transposition is generalized. Now it's an inversion of sets of three um, elements where each element uh, consists of two numbers. Well, I, I didn't display here the second chain um, uh, of the B42, which starts with the same um, lexicographical order, ends up with the, the same here, reverse lexicographical order, but the steps in between are different. The formal definition of Hayabuha orders is as follows. So again, we have the, the basic set, the, the numbers from one to big N. We consider the set of all small N element subsets of this set. Then a linear order, a permutation of the elements of this set is called admissible if for any um, set, con sorry, set containing, if for any set containing n plus one elements of this set, the packet is in lexicographically, uh, in lexicographical or reverse lexicographical order. So this simply accounts for this idea that uh, going from the lexicographical order to the reverse lexicographical order, we simply can apply inversions. So what we get in between are only um, structures, or, so um, linear orders, which contain the packets to which an inversion is, uh, is applied in lexicographical or in reverse lexicographical order. The set of all such admissible orders is called A big N comma small N. There is an equivalence relation for elements of this set. If they only differ by exchange of two neighboring elements, which are not both contained in some packet for, uh, the, uh, some k of this kind, uh, then this is an equivalence. And the higher Bruha order is the quotient of A with respect to this equivalence relation. The partial order is um, obtained by inversions of, le of a lexicographically ordered packet, mm -hmm. which is mapped to the, uh, to the reverse order packet. So an arrow over um, uh, P indicates the lexicographical order of a packet um, and the reverse arrow means reverse lexicographical order of a packet. Um, simplex equations 
and then corresponds via the way of um, yeah, um, realization uh, uh, via our kind of realization in this, for example, set theoretical framework to um, be n plus one and minus one uh, to a uh, big n element subset. We associate a map uh, from this set to this set where this notation means um, we take um, the direct product of sets corresponding to the numbers in the packet P of K, and we take it in lexicographical order. This is then the corresponding direct product in reverse order. Uh, with an exchange of neighboring elements, um, an allowed exchange, we associated, uh, we associate the respective uh, transposition. If big N is equal to two, then we're dealing with B31. And I explained to you how this leads to the young Bexler equation. Here is again, uh, one of the two maximal chains of B42, which I showed you before. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, could we uh, get some... Uh comments about the definition, about the, the term, the re realization of the Brewer order. Uh, uh, could it be reformulated uh, in terms of some functors in, uh, of uh, categories? Is it, is it um, uh, feasible? Is it uh, useful in this context? Uh, well, there are, uh, there are certainly um, relation and uh, I, I uh, do think that the we had orders um, also make um, make sense in a uh, category theoretical framework, but uh, I would say this this goes uh, too far away from uh, from here. This is uh, my question. Much more much more down to earth. Uh, my, my question is about the notion of realization. Ah, on the previous page, yes, the realization. Yeah, but uh, yeah, this this is simply. Um, you see whether whether set i j um, i um, um, i so or, or with any tuple of numbers i j i j k i associate the direct product of sets. For, for each number, there is a set. Then uh, this is simply the um, correspondence, the the way of realizing things. No? So if there is a um, number one, one, two here, we can associate um, a set with it. So just an attribution uh, of uh, a linear of, 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 the, of the map to each transposition, to each, to each inversion in the series of inversion in, the, uh, in this process, uh, isn't it? Well, um, uh, let's let's just uh, just take take this example here. So um, uh, uh, the way of realizing it is assigning with all these elements here a set. You see now yeah, three, map, three in a row in relation. Sorry, Th three in a row in relation. Um, well, because uh, it's an equal set. Um, you see, um, uh, I showed you before. Uh, B3, B32. Uh, in this case, you only have three elements and there's only a way of doing an inversion by acting on three elements. Here I have more guys. Uh, so the inversion only acts, still only acts on three elements. Yeah, be, uh, because a set which determines an inversion is, um, uh, 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 consists here of three numbers if the elements of such a linear order consists of two numbers. So um, if I have the set one, two, three, to, to this corresponds a, a packet which consists of these three guys, and to these three guys, an inversion can be applied. Now the realization is uh, simply by associating with the elements of a linear order a corresponding set. 
Okay. Uh, uh, to, yeah. to, uh, this element one, two, I associate a set U one, two. Um, uh, to um, uh, a triplet of these guys, I associate the direct product of these sets. Uh, so this, why, uh, this is why um, this map is now acting on the um, uh, direct product of, this, of the sets, which are associated with, uh, sorry, these three guys here. Uh, and this is the map which is shown here. Yeah. Now we um, follow um, the, these steps. First, there is a permutation. The permutation takes place at the third and fourth place um, in this direct product of spaces. Then, yeah, that's why we have a permutation map P three. P three stands for the permutation taking place at positions three and four. Um, in uh, in a direct product. Yeah. Then next, we apply a map um, R123, which acts at position one and the following two positions. Yeah. In the next step, we, we see a map R124 uh, acting on the third position. Well, the position indices are somehow redundant at this point because all the information is really in the combinatorial indices. But um, um, if we um, read off these position indices, I can do what I did before in case of the young bexel equation. I can forget these combinatorial indices, only keep the position indices. Yeah? And then you get um, another way of describing this equation. From the second, for, uh, second chain of B, B42, which I don't display here, we get the right-hand side here. The, so um, first, okay, hope you can see it. Uh, first the map uh, R23, well, sorry, I have to go back. Okay, this, I have to shift here my, um, uh, well, okay, uh, so uh, in that case, we, we start with the map uh, 234, then comes the map uh, R134, and, and so on. Uh, so, oh, sorry, okay, I should rather take this one here. Um, uh, so you, uh, from this these two chains of uh, B42, you read off an equation, um, which is the, um, a three simple uh, three simplex equation um, in terms of the composition of R with a reversion, which is given here by a permutation acting at the position one and three. If R is considered to act on a threefold uh, direct sum, then this takes the following form here, and uh, this is um, uh, a form of the Samologikov or tetrahedron equation, you surely know. Um, here we can drop the combinatorial indices, which are here given in complementary notations. So small, uh, this, this one head, one with the head, means the complement um, in the um, set of numbers um, uh, from uh, here, one to three, so, so it stands for, um, here, two, 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 three, four. So this goes to the complement one head and so on. Um, in particular, if it comes to higher simplex equations, uh, this is very convenient yeah. to go to the complementary index notation because otherwise you're dealing with very long numbers. So um, uh, this is the way in which uh, these Bruhan orders uh, B n plus one and minus one um, are related to simplex equations. Uh, let me now explain um, how you can get from local young Baxter to tetrahedron, which is an example of what is sometimes called um, an integrability feature of the simplex equations. 
Well, the, these two orders or, or the, these two maximal chains here form B31 if I, J, K are one, two, three. Um, if you consider uh, B41, this consists of um, uh, four of these chains uh, with simply with numbers ex exchanged. Uh, we associate it with such a guy, a young Baxter equation. So if I is one, J is uh, two, K is three, then um, there, there is a corresponding uh, young Baxter equation, which we now um, consider as being localized. That means we um, consider the young Baxter equation up to a map. Uh, on the left hand side, we assume that the corresponding maps, which we now um, um, uh, well, uh, which are now our L's before they were R's in, um, in the Young Baxter case. So the left hand side, um, the guys on the left hand side depend on variables u. Um, the right hand side depends on different variables v. And uh, the assumption is that um, such an equation determines uniquely a map from the u's to the v's. This means in this case, a map rijk from this direct product to the reverse direct product. So um, this is what, uh, what is called um, local two simplex or local young Bexel equation. So he, he actually we, we consider a whole set of these guys. This um, has to do with the fact that in general, we were dealing with, um, well, analogs of entwining young Bexel equations. So young, uh, young Bexel equation and simplest equations, which have different maps, which, uh, which are built with different maps. Then that's why in um, this case, in the most general case, I need a whole system. And uh, this is determined by B41, although B31 already determines a young Bexel equation. Now, um, the next step is to write down um, a composition of six of these uh, maps L. Uh, L12 depends on a parameter U12. L13 depends on a parameter U13 and so on. And um, here we see uh, two numbers, two, three, one, four, which in the Bruhan order allow an exchange. So these, the corresponding maps act on different spaces. They have nothing to do with each other. So uh, we can commute them. On the level of the parameters, this means a permutation. Um, then we see here in the brackets, a composition of maps to which uh, we can apply one of the local young Baxter equations. So the result is this the composition here of maps. Um, in the next step, um, uh, I can apply, um, um, well, here we can commute these two guys, which corresponds to, to um, permutation. Um, another, um, the, these two guys commute, so there is another permutation. And uh, now, we get three L's in the correct order so that we can apply again one of the local Young Bexel equations. So if we do this step, then this means on the level of the parameters that we apply a map R134, because 134 are the numbers. Uh, here you see the packet of the set 134. Um, uh, finally, uh, we can apply a, young, a local young Bexel equation to this composition of maps, and we end up here. Well, this is one way of doing it. And um, if you 
uh, consider now the composition of maps, which are here in green, then this is the um, left-hand side of the three simplex equation of the tetrahedral equation. But there is another way of reordering um, this composition of six L's. Um, maybe you can start by applying a local Leon Baxter equation to the composition of the first three guys and uh, follow the way. And you will end up um, in green here on the level of parameters with the red right hand side um, of the three simplex equation. This means that there is a consistency condition of the system of local two simplex equations. And this is the three simplex equation. This is the tetrahedral equation. This is important because it, is, um, it has been the main tool to um, construct um, solutions of, for example, the tetrahedral equation from, um, uh, yeah, uh, from um, uh, your, your solutions of um, local young Baxter equations. And of course, uh, what we have done in reordering the L's is nothing but the structure of B42. Here are the two chains. Uh, lexicographical order here, reverse. Same lexicographical order here, reverse lexicographical order. These two guys uh, correspond to a composition of L's. And um, we reordered them uh, um, correspondingly here. Uh, so uh, uh, we don't have to do um, the, uh, uh, what we have done uh, before, namely writing down the sequences of L's, uh, because we can uh, read off um, the, the result right from, uh, from these, um, lin uh, this uh, uh, <clears throat> um, This kind of integrability of simplex equation, um, I think first appeared in paper by uh, Maillet and Nyhoff around 1990. So in general, we have the following situation. Um, we consider an n simplex equation localized. This means um, up to a map from U to V. Um, the map is given by this way. Then we consider a system of local n simplex equations. Um, in the simplest case, it would be uh, uh, here, these are the same equation if you uh, consider only one map depending on a parameter. But uh, here we have a more general situation. So in general, uh, we have to consider systems of such equations. Then we can consider a composition of such um, n-simplex maps. And there are two ways of uh, reordering it to finally end up with the inverse, the reversed order of these guys. And from these two ways of reordering, we um, have uh, restrictions on the map. And this is the n plus one simplex equation. This is a crucial property of the family of simplex equation. Here, um, if, uh, we use the hatted version um, of the and simplex equations in order to avoid permutation maps. Um, in this case, it is straight to write down these compositions of maps and doing the steps to reverse them. If um, big N is greater three, uh, the, the simplex equation would uh, contain otherwise, um, well, without a head, would contain otherwise the permutation maps. Um, now, um, the next part is about Tamari orders. Um, the main idea is here to split a packet into uh, odd and even elements. So um, this uh, P uh, not of K um, means um, the set of elements of a packet um, where the, uh, which are in uh, which are at odd 
position in the lexicographical order. Uh, P E of K um, is correspondingly the set of elements in even uh, at even position in the lexicographical order. So this is the splitting of a packet. Um, the inversion operation in the case of Tamari orders is then given by uh, mapping the um, lexicographically ordered odd half packet to the reverse lexicographically ordered even half packet. And of course, uh, we have to eliminate all those elements in linear orders in the corresponding Bruja or um, um, orders uh, that are not accordance, accord, uh, not in accordance with the splitting of packets in with this rule. So uh, here's the simplest example. B32, uh, I already showed you the simplest Bruja order somehow, um, where, uh, which only consists of uh, two linear orders, the lexicographical one and the reverse lexicographically ordered. And there's only one set um, uh, for which we can uh, consider a packet. So maybe one, two, three, this is the full set. Then the um, packet of it uh, consists of the um, sets one, two, one, three, two, three. Uh, so um, in this case, the odd half packet is um, simply the set of the elements one, two, and two, three, because they are at odd position in the lexicographical order. Um, the even half, pack, uh, even half packet is um, well, uh, only consists of a single element, which is this one, because it's at the second position in the lex lexicographical order. So um, uh, this, this means now for the Tamari order, we should forget about one, three, and only consider one, two, and two, three, and this is mapped to one, three. Um, the appearance in physics is as follows. Um, again, we consider the case we previously considered where we have three phases. Uh, now we consider the maximum function of, of these phases. And um, uh, you can, um, well, uh, this uh, maximum function now divides the plane into three regions. One in which theta one dominates, um, another one in which theta two dominates, and the third one in which theta three dominates. Um, uh, uh, the corresponding boundary lines are here, the fat half lines, and um, um, the other half lines here become somehow invisible because, for example, this half line between, well, um, determined by theta two equal to theta three, lies in a region where another phase dominates. So this becomes invisible. This is precisely what appears in a, a, a certain description of, um, um, uh, of a class of solitons of the, of the KP equation. And um, in our first uh, um, treatment, treatment of um, uh, these structures, we uh, spoke about the visible and invisible elements. So, um, well, if we look again at this as a process in y direction, then we see here one, two, one, three, two, three, which is the Bruja order, but one, three is, is not visible. So let's, um, mark, uh, let's color it red. And uh, one, two, two, three are visible. Um, then um, um, the result of this, well, uh, kind of process is um, the reverse ordered, but now 
um, two or three is invisible and the boundary line given by theta one equal to uh, theta two is also invisible. So we should color these two guys red. And what is visible here is um, the half line uh, one three. So this is colored blue. Um, so this leads uh, to a um, definition of uh, Tamari orders in terms of colors. Um, we say that an element of an odd packet, an uh, odd half packet is blue in the lexicographical order. Um, and we say it is red in a reverse lexicographical ordered packet. Correspondingly, an element of the even half packet is red in the lexicographical order and blue in the reverse lexicographical order. And then we have to go on and define what means an element is blue or red in, um, um, ich, uh, in a linear order. So an element of this, sp uh, this space A, big N, comma, small N. And uh, this is such that we say, okay, an element is blue uh, in a linear order if it is blue with respect to all Ks for which J is contained in the corresponding packet and correspondingly red. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> it can happen now that an element is blue with, res with respect to, uh, blue in a linear order with respect to some K, but red with respect to another K. In such a case, we color it green. And um, one can prove that the projection from a Bruja order to one of its colored uh, parts uh, is well defined, and that this colored part inherits a partial order from the Bruja order. And we then define the high Tamari orders, T big N, comma small n, as the blue part of the corresponding um, Bruja order. So here is an example, again, B42, which uh, you've seen before, but now um, colors have a meaning, a clear meaning. Um, one, two um, is in, uh, um, well, um, yeah, um, okay. One, um, here we can consider, for example, one, two, one, three, two, three. Um, these guys are in the packet of one, two, three. So, and this is, of course, a lexicographical order because uh, this uh, chain here is completely lexicographically ordered. Uh, so um, since one, two, and two, three are at odd positions in the packet, they become blue. Um, it could be in principle that there is another um, packet with respect to, uh, to which this is uh, red, but this does not, uh, this is not the case with this first guy. But if you look at one three, uh, one three is at even position in the packet one, two, one, three, two, three. Uh, so it, uh, we have to color it red. But if we look at the packet, um, uh, well, yeah, the packet consisting of one, three, uh, two, three, and two, well, one, three, two, three, and um, you see, one, three, where is it? Two, three.
Okay, well, okay, let's take um, um, okay. It's one three one four three four three four. You uh, okay? You're great. Uh, uh, you understand better than I do. No? So one three one four three four, for example. In this case, one three is the first um, uh, guy in the lexicographically ordered packet, so it must be blue. So with respect to one um, three element set. It is red with respect to another, it is blue. So we have to color it green. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, we have to check um, the corresponding packets um, and um, um, figure out um, what the color of a guy is. And this has to be done for uh, each of these orders separately. In, in this way, we get to this coloring. Um, and there is a subsequence of blue guys, which I uh, told you um, corresponds to what we define as the Tamari order. This is now the Tamari or T4, T4, two. And if you read off the blue part, this gives you this chain here. From the second chain, of B42, we get this uh, second chain of uh, T4, comma two. Um, the the red guys here form a dual Tamari order. The green uh, guys here form what we call a mixed a mixed order. But I will not consider them in the folding. But we will. Um, restrict our considerations to the Tamari orders. Um, in 2012, when we first defined these structures, we uh, conjectured that these higher Tamari orders are equivalent what, uh, to uh, what was known as higher stash of Tamari orders defined in terms of triangulations of cyclic polytopes. And in 2020, a proof has been provided by Nicholas Will Williams. Um, in the same way as uh, we associate um, a simplex equation with a certain Bruyne order, uh, we um, also have Tamari orders, um, which only consists, uh, consists of two maximal um, chains, and they uh, give us in the same way, the same kind of um, realizing these orders, um, an equation which we call the Engon equation. So it leads to a family of equations which we called um, polygon equations in 2015. Um, in the example of T5, comma three, um, uh, the two maximal chains are displayed here. So again, with each number we associate a set. Um, with one, two, three, we associate a set U, one, two, three, and, and so on. Um, with um, such a linear order, we associate the direct product of the corresponding sets. Um, with, the, with the numbers um, which determine packets and inversions, we associate a map, which now depends on four, four numbers, and it maps from this direct product to, the, um, to this direct product. Now we have different sets on both sides. Um, and we, we can read off an equation now. Um, <clears throat> this starts um, with the map one, two, three, four, um, so the complement is the five. This is then composed with the map T3 three hat. Uh, three is the missing number here. 
and then comes the map T1. This is one side. This gives you another side um, where here a permutation map is um, at place. Um, if we pass over to the co composition of um, the map T with the permutation, this takes this form and um, well, these equations are versions of what is called the Pentagon equation. Here, um, again, I also uh, wrote the position indices, which uh, tell us on which, um, yeah, um, on which members of the, um, of a direct product of spaces, the corresponding map X. Um, of course, from the um, perspective of the combinatorial indices, they are redundant because they are consequence. They can simply be read off. But um, you can drop now also the combinatorial indices here, and uh, you get a version which you will probably find some reps in the literature. So the relevance of this Pentagon equation is as follows, any finite dimensional Hoff algebra, for example, is char characterized by an invertible solution of the Pentagon equation. In a C star algebraic setting, a, a solution of the Pentagon equation is called multiplicative unitary. The Pentagon equation appears in structures up to homotopy. So for example, homotopy associative algebras, which Sasha um, um, introduced, um, there is an appearance in categorical theoretical framework. It also appears in conformal field theory in connection with associativity. Um, it uh, appeared also in uh, an attempt to um, yeah, derive somehow invariance of three manifolds via triangulations and realize the realization of partner, partner moves which act on triangulation and this has been pursued by Koropanov. Beyond the Pentagon equation, we have the hexagon equation, which is the three to two map. And the corresponding equation is displayed here. The heptagon equation is a three to three map, which is displayed here. The structure becomes more and more complicated. In this case, it is um, easy to um, pass over to a simpler version by um, again, um, um, composing T with a reversion. Uh, so we get this equation. Again, we could drop the combinatory indices, keep only the position indices, which tell you on which um, factors in a direct product, the corresponding map X, X. And again, we um, find an equation which uh, appeared in the literature. Um, in case of even a polygon equation like the hexagon equation, um, the um, a transition to um, such a map is a bit more complicated. We achieved this by introducing an auxiliary set. Um, there may be other ways and uh, uh, Korupanov is quite right in complaining that this is um, not aesthetic. I think uh, this is the way he uh, posts it, but nevertheless, it, it, it does the job uh, if we consider the integrability between neighboring uh, polygon equations, which um, appears in the same way as um, the integrability between neighboring simplex equations. Here is an example um, which starts with the foregone equation. Um, here we, we have the structure of T4, uh, T4,2, uh, uh, which consists of these two maximal chains. Um, in T5,2, there are um, five. Uh, there, there's five times these structures with different numbers. For example, um, this guy. Uh, with this structure, we associate a foregone equation. 
Um, but we should consider it localized. So the guys on the left-hand side depend on some on variable, variables u, the guys on the right-hand side on variables v. So uh, we assume that this determines a map. This way, um, well, um, and correspondingly for the other local um, um, tetra, uh, well, um, uh, uh, here for the other local foregone equations, uh, which appear from the structure. Uh, then we we can follow the chains of uh, T five three, um, and for example consider a corresponding composition of L's, um, and uh, these these steps here uh, correspond to operations um, uh, by applying. Um, a local foregone equation. Uh, so for example, we, uh, we start with this composition, then we can apply uh, one of the foregone equations to um, this composition of two L's né? and end up with these two guys here. Uh, in the next step, we can apply a local foregone equation to this composition and so on. Né? So on the level of parameters, this means we apply a composition of these three maps. The second chain is this one, and correspondingly, um, uh, it uh, here we can follow it to um, achieve such a reversion of this comp composition, which uh, which I started with. Um, uh, previously um, in a different way. And uh, on the level of parameters, this means an application of the composition of these maps. And this means that T satisfies the pentagon equation. Uh, so um, this is a simple example, which it goes through to uh, higher orders. And um, it means finally that if you consider a set of localized n simplex equation, uh, so, sorry, n gon equation, um, this leads to a consistency uh, um, condition, which is the n plus one polygon equation. <clears throat> uh, the three color uh, decomposition of a simplex equation um, also leads to a relation between solutions. Uh, which, however, is probably a very simple. Uh, this generalizes a result by Kashav and Zergeev, um, which found that special solutions of the four simplex equation can be constructed from solution of the pentagon equation and its dual. Uh, so um, uh, the generalization is as such, uh, we can write an um, n minus one simplex equation map uh, in such a way which involves um, the Tamari map and a dual Tamari map uh, corresponding to the red orders which you have seen. Um, and then the result is that the n minus one simplex equation reduces to an n-gon equation for this map and a dual n-gon equation for this map and some um, compatibility equation. The um, second remark uh, concerns the visualization of um, um, simple, uh, of simplex and polygon equation on the polyhedra. Um, here is a familiar visualization of the young baxter equation on the cube, which can be identified with B30, which is the Boolean lattice of the numbers one, two, three this case, but um, let's leave this aside. So um, this uh, means here a deformation of a maximal chain um, over, over the cube uh, from a lexicographical order to reverse lexicographical order. And this can be done um, in two ways corresponding to 
operation on two sides, sorry, on two sides of, uh, um, um, of this cube. Correspondingly, um, the three simplex equation or tetrahedron equation describes deformations of maximal chains on the two sides of the permutohedron formed by B41. For the four simplex equation, the corresponding polyhedron is B52. Um, the pentagon equation is visualized in the same way on a cube formed by the Tamari order T52. Um, uh, the, the only, uh, well, basically you see here different numbers and um, in case of one step, uh, uh, here we see we, here we have uh, sets here, um, uh, which have, well, nothing to do with each other. So this corresponds to permutation maps, whereas all the other um, operations which take place on this cube corresponds to application of a map T. Um, the hexagon equation uh, can be visualized as a sequence of maximal chains um, on the associahedron, the, the Stasher polytope in three dimensions. And um, this is um, displayed here. So if you uh, start with this lexicographically ordered chain, here the numbers are the uh, complementary numbers. So five, six actually stands for one, two, three, four. Um, so uh, you go this way until you end up with a, uh, with a, re with a reversely ordered chain and correspondingly on the other side of the um, associahedron. The associahedron is actually not really um, polyhedron. Um, because it cannot be embedded in Euclidean space with only flat um, surfaces. So summary, um, via the three color decomposition of higher Bruja orders, we obtain or we defined higher Tamari orders from higher Bruja orders. Um, the higher Bruja orders in particular define simplex equations, the higher Tamari orders define polygon equations. In the same way as the simplex equation generalizes the young bexter equation, the polygon equation generalizes the, uh, generalizes the pentagon equation. Um, and the polygon equations form an infinite family of equations related by the same kind of integrability that contains uh, sorry, that connects the um, neighboring simplex equations. Further remarks. The fact that the Pentagon equation um, plays, uh, uh, plays such an important role in um, various areas of mathematics suggests the um, significance also of the higher polygon equations, which however still has to be proved. Um, a hexagon equation appeared in work of Koripanov and Kashaev um, um, as uh, in the context of realizations of Pachner moves uh, of triangulations of the four manifolds, the same way as the pentagon um, equation is related to triangulations of, um, of a three manifold. This is certainly an interesting um, uh, project. A heptagon equation appeared in the form of an algebraic identity for a Q exponential function, a work by Folkov. Um, then um, uh, I would like to mention work by um, De Marcus and Koropano from uh, 2021, um, um, where they uh, derived solutions of um, odd polygon and also even simplex equations acting on direct sums given by matrices which are built of quotients of Plücker coordinates of address many. Um, beside that, um, polygon equations are um, a fairly new terrain. Uh, our definition of higher Tamari orders emerged from an exploration of rooted binary tree shaped KP solitons in what we called a tropical limit. Um, the question arises 
um, whether we can construct solutions of polygon equations based on this result using vector and matrix KP in a way similar to the construction of young Baxter maps from matrix solid interactions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you thank very much. Other questions? Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, Volker, please. Uh, give... yeah, I think uh, Benjamin uh, wants to ask a question. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No, sorry, I was. Hello? Uh, your, your microphone is switched off. Uh, my yeah, microphone yeah, yeah. is switched off. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, misunderstood. I misunderstood. He was just uh, uploading, and I thought uh, he wanted a question. Uh, I, have, I have some questions. Uh, Folk, uh, please yeah. give me a direction uh, in the categorical interpretation of the relation between Tamari order and the Brua order. So, how to generalize it and to 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 produce some geometric uh, interpretation of this uh, relation? Uh, uh, so, for for me, uh, some uh, some problem is that uh, the relation between Brea order and Tamari order is quite strict. So, it's it's a, it's a real decomposition of uh, of this uh, order set. But on the level of solutions of such equation, uh, it is. Uh, uh, quite de de degenerate. So, uh, ju just on only some solutions for the, uh, for example, for the for simplex equation uh, can be uh, expressed in terms of uh, solution of the pentagon equation. Uh, so, the you see the last uh, last sentence again. Here, of which equation? Uh, uh, am I right that uh, we can compose, uh, we can construct solution for the first simplex equation starting from uh, solutions of the pentagon equations of two, two, uh, uh, two solutions of the pentagon equation? Yeah, right. Uh -huh. So, but uh, it's... Uh, yeah, so uh, of, of course, this is, um, um, uh, well, I, I don't expect that you really get. Um, um, Something efficient. We have very interesting solutions in in this way. Um, this is an example of a um, uh, of a relation where, in principle, um, from uh, you can get solutions of the simplex uh, of a simplex equation from solutions of the pentagon equation and the dual pentagon equations. Um, I um, told you there is still um, a compatibility condition to be satisfied. In addition, uh, so between the um, this Tamari map and the, uh, yeah, the dual map, no? so it's still restricted. It's not uh, not very straightforward, but in principle, it is a way of constructing a certain, probably very special solutions um, mm -hmm. of a of a simplex equation. Um, uh, first of all, of course, uh, um, the the simplex equations and pentagon equations act really in different areas in mathematics. Uh, so it is maybe quite surprising that they can be uh, related in this simple way by projecting Bruja orders. Um, uh, simplex equations, as we know, have to do with integrable systems. Um, the, the Pentagon equation uh, has to do with associativity up to something. Um, um, so maybe there are some structural relations, but uh, still, um, I I would say that these pentagon equations appear really in a very in very different applications. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, another question, but maybe it's some project. So uh, you probably know what is the uh, two braided category. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, have you ever uh, 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 ever meet the uh, generalization of the Brewer order? Then the uh, uh, the equivalence relation. Uh, uh, so it could be uh, named as a uh, long distance commutativity. 
is replaced by a representation of some, uh, by some uh, by some operator. Uh, well, um, I must say I'm I'm not really familiar with this, but I remember uh, I've seen work um, generalizing these Breha orders um, in in this kind of way. Uh, I ask this uh, because I, I have some intuition that in in such a in such a generalization we we can get uh, LC Tamari order, but in some uh, more general uh, relation with the Brua order. Because the permutahedron equation uh, it's a natural generalization of the of the tetrahedron equation if we generalize this long distance commutativity. Uh, but maybe it's a question for yeah yeah yeah. Discussion. Um, yeah sorry, I may, I to... may I also also yeah, ask sure. a question? Just sure. I guess just um, uh, there is a when you spoke about Bra order, you speak about the weak Bra order. So just uh, uh, I know there exists strong Bra order. So what's the difference? Can you explain it briefly? Well, um, it's uh, it's not so um, well. Yeah, uh, I uh, sorry, I, I I don't quite uh, quite remember. Uh, I, I I never exploited this strong Bruja order. No. Yes, uh, there is a different um, order uh, on the on the set of uh, permutations, um, but I, I I don't remember uh, how precisely this. Yeah, yeah, I mean that uh, I've seen these diagrams which you draw for the Broward and uh, S four and then S three, but these in these cases there were additional, you know, additional errors and disorders, and that's what. So I just wonder whether it's because it was diagrams for strong Broward order. No, <laughs> uh, just... no, 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 no. Uh, uh, all um, well, um, uh, this generalization of higher Bruja order. Is a general generalization of the weak Bruja order on the set of permutations of numbers one, two, three, and so uh, on. I see. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I don't yeah. know a counter. Uh, I, I don't think there is a counterpart. Mm. Um, of, uh, I mean, of the strong Bruja order on the set of permutations mm. uh, to a sort of strong higher Bruja orders. I don't think this exists. I mean, because strong Bruja order naturally appears in the calculus of uh, Schubert cells. There is this, you know, the theorem which says that two Schubert cells are adjacent if and only yes. if one is follows the other one with respect to the Strombrea order, as far as I can understand. Right. Um, yeah, so maybe, just... yeah, maybe there are generalizations of, the, oh. of these structures, but this is not long. Mm, I see. Yeah, I, I probably would uh, um, uh, gotten uh, across uh, corresponding papers because from time to time I search the web for <laughs> uh, uh, for new publications. Uh, so I don't think this exists at, at present, but mm. it could be hidden in some structures mm -hmm. which I'm not really familiar with. No, I see, I see. Mm. Yeah. But I, whether there exists it? some kind of Schubert cell calculus for the higher Brea orders. For higher Tamari order? Tamari orders for Brea orders, mm -hmm. uh, high, high, uh, we don't know, highest Brea orders and so on. I mean, I you spoke know. about the higher Brea orders, and uh, I know there is this Schubert calculus for the usual Brea order. Yeah. Whether it's strong or weak, I don't, don't care. Yeah, so. It's related with some uh, other uh, algebra. OK. With hyperplane configurations, if I am right. Yeah, but it might be. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's it's probably uh, calculus of. It's not the Schubert. Yeah, okay. not Schubert. Yeah, it's similar to Schubert. It might be so. Never seen this. Okay, uh, uh, Volker, I'd like to thank you for this interesting and. Uh, any, more, any more questions? Uh yeah, can I, can I pose, can I, I pose think Frank, question? Frank wants to ask a question. Yes, and I want to ask a question as well, Dima. Frank, hi. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Falkert, for a very nice talk. Uh, and um, 
uh, also very, uh, I learned a lot of it, but I, I was a bit puzzled by your comment that the Pentagon equation and the, uh, uh, didn't have anything to do or seem, uh, I don't know if the, that was what you suggested, didn't have anything to do with integrability. Uh, because I know at least of two kind of incidences where the Pentagon equation appears. One would be in actually the, uh, in the structure of the uh, Lagrangians for, uh, for uh, integral quad equations where they play the role through kind of dialogarithm ad identities. Yeah. That's one place. And another place would be in the um, so-called Dreamfeld, tw Dreamfeld twist object, mm -hmm. the, uh, which decomposes the R matrix uh, as far as I understand. So um, I think there is a clear connection with in integrability with the Pentagon equation and Pentagon and higher pen, higher maybe heptagon etc objects as well. Um, uh, well, this this has to be um, seen. Of, of course, it also depends what you consider um, as integrability. Uh, of course, it, it is known that in the um, in the case of dialogarithms, um, such equations appear. Uh, but uh, in this case, I would say this is more. Um, um, yeah, um, the structure behind these, um, well, uh, uh, these dialogarisms. And um, I don't know if we can really um, say this is a sort of integrability, which is um, behind well, the I, 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 I mean, that's... Um, I disagree in some sense because what we have found, for instance, in the uh, what we call multi Lagrangian multiform theory, which is this kind of um, yeah. extended form of variational calculus for integrable systems, is that you have these closure relations, and these closure relations, in the way we proved them in the beginning, were were essentially using kind of pentagon moves rather than what was later done by Suris and Bobenko using flip maps, which is star triangle type relations. Mm -hmm. But we used actually kind of uh, pentagon type moves and they seem to be essential actually in the kind of multi-dimensional consistency of those quad equations that are described by those Lagrange structures. Uh -huh. uh, very, very interesting. Um, I, I must confess that I overlooked this work of yours. They, I, I mean, I know the, these papers, but uh, of course, knowing doesn't mean uh, reading the yeah, carefully. I understand. I understand this now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would really appreciate if you um, could send me an email um, with the corresponding reference. I mean, you have a, a, quite a lot of papers, so uh, that would help me to uh, uh, figure out which are relevant in this respect. But okay. thanks a lot for this comment. It's uh, okay. it's, it's very interesting. You're welcome, you're welcome. But thank you for your talk. It was a very nice and clear talk. Thank you. So, Thiris. Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, thank, for, for, first of all, thanks very much for a very interesting uh, and understandable talk. So, my question is the following. So, uh, when, uh, 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 well, you assume uh, that uh, the local Young Baxter equation, uh, the unique solutions to the Young Baxter equation, uh, uh, derive, uh, give solutions to the tetrahedron. Is it, uh, do you make the same assumptions, uh, the same assumption in the Pentagon equation? So is it, uh, yes. has, does it have to be a unique solution to the Pentagon equation to? Yeah, if, uh, if I understood correctly, um, um, if, um, if this is a question, of course you can now, um, consider a system of local pentagon equations. And then the consistency condition will be um, a hexagon equation. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, does this answer your question or- Yeah, but do, I, do they have to be unique solutions of the local- Yes, yes, yes of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise you, uh, and this is actually a very uh, difficult um, point in practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you, um, if you want to show that um, uh, such an equation really determines uniquely a map, um, this mm -hmm. is absolutely non-trivial, non unfortunately. Yeah, 
So, uh, so another question is like, uh, you know, I have many, very many examples of uh, non-unique solutions. Uh, so correspondences that satisfying uh, the say n minus one local uh, 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 simplex equation that uh, for particular values of the free variables uh, give uh, solutions to them a uh, simplex equation that uh, do not uh, belong to the known uh, classification list. Uh, do, do you know any examples of uh, correspondences that satisfy the local pentagon equation and for particular values of the free variables give solutions to the n, uh, uh, n, n polygon equation? I don't. Mm -hmm. No, uh, yeah, I didn't really uh, uh, work this out in um, in concrete cases. I must say. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Uh, may I ask a, a simple question? Uh, that um, you mentioned uh, a connection between uh, these uh, triangle structures, the simplex equation, I think, with solitons of the KP equation. Uh, yes. What uh, what kind of connection is that? How can one uh, see that with uh, with the special solutions and not just the equations, soliton equations? Uh, how does one do that? And then from pentagon equations, you connected them to Young Baxter, uh, Young Baxter equations or solutions of the Young Baxter equations. How does does one see this connection more explicitly? I mean. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I, I understood the question. Um, you see, all these Tamari orders um, arose from uh, my work with Demarcus uh, on understanding the structure of KP solutions. And in particular, this concerns a class of solutions which at fixed time has the form of a, a rooted binary tree. Rooted binary trees are well known, um, uh, giving a representation of associativity relations. The, originally, the Tamari lattices um, were understood as applications of the associativity law in one direction. Now, this is the this is then the order. Um, so. Uh, the background is somehow having associativity up to a map. So you do not think about associativity as an equation, but as a map from the left-hand side of the associativity equation to the right-hand side, say. Yeah, the uh, rooted binary trees um, realized this um, via right rotation in tree. Um, uh, so um, uh, this, this means that these rooted, or oh, this finally leads to the fact that um, so, um, these soliton solutions of the KP equation, which have at fixed time the form of a rooted binary trees, the tree, um, mm. can realize all the Tamari orders. Mm -hmm. so, all, uh, actually also the higher Tamari. Now, um, uh, shall I give you um, an example or uh, would this go too far? No, no, please, go ahead. Okay, um, well, here. Uh, here, uh -huh. we, here we have the Tamari order 5,3, which mm -hmm. is a pentagon. And you start with a left comp structure, then um, you can perform rotations by trees, so certain of these um, arms here will mm -hmm. um, go, to, uh, will move to some vertex and then turn to, to the other side. Uh, so, um, well, uh, this can be done in two different ways until you end up with the left comp structure. So you start somehow with the right comp structure, you end up with the left comp structure. And this here is time evolution. The time evolution on this idealized syllabus. So I mm -hmm. uh, consider um, solutions of the um, of the KP equation um, 
uh, take a contour plot, and then I see they have a certain rooted boundary form. And this is the idealized rooted boundary form of these and, things. Yeah, and the time evolution yeah. you said? And is... this is time evolution. So oh. there, there is a special time event, T1234, uh -huh. at which, um, um, which is the stage in between this rotation of trees. Before we have this um, uh, rooted tree structure, afterwards we have this one. Yeah? Um, yes. If you um, add one more soliton, then you have this structure. So um, uh, then there are several ways of um, um, uh, time evolution, with, uh, w how time evolution, uh, evolution can um, lead you from an initial configuration at t minus infinity to the final uh, configuration as at uh, t equal to infinity. No? Or, or close to infinity. Uh, and which um, way the system takes depends on the parameters of the system, of the solution, sorry. Yeah? Um, uh, so um, uh, the nice observation uh, which we made around uh, 2011, 2012, is that um, the time evolution of these special uh, KP solitons mm -hmm. realizes all the, all the Tamari lattices to any order. Um, uh, here, concerning the, the, the question of, um, uh, of categories and the like, there is actually here a kind of um, uh, category uh, structure at work. So if you consider these um, well, this should uh, rather be arrows as morphisms. Then there are higher morphisms which lead from um, from the left side to the right side. Yeah, and um, this would uh, mean um, this would be associated with a time which has five now five indices: one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, mm -hmm. correspondingly. Um, uh, well, this this leads to to the uh, to a structure which you may consider as being um, um, uh, um, being a higher um, uh, as, as having the structure of a higher a higher a higher category. Yes. So if I had a, a non-integrable, if I perturb the equation somewhat, then could could this structure not be periodic would not it would uh, break down this pentagon would would not exist if the equation was uh, uh, modified yeah. wait a second which uh, which equation uh, do you uh, mean the, the, the kp the, the kp, KP equations well, <laughs> the, the time I, goes around mm -hmm. i i have no idea i have no idea frankly um um you see it is it is quite quite amazing that um, the KP equation is so special and it has um, uh, such a, a variety of beautiful structures, mm -hmm. uh, which appeared before in combinatorics. Uh, along along the fact that time evolution um, on this level of of the set of rooted binary tree shaped solutions is um, given by right rotation in a tree is, is, is really absolutely surprising. Yeah, and this is an associativity relation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we know, because this representation in terms of rooted binary tree is equivalent to the uh, old representations of these associativity diagrams um, first formulated by, uh, by Tamari in terms of associativity moves. Thank you very much. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you very much.
Okay, I suppose it's time to, to finish. Mm. Yeah, sorry for taking too much of your time. No, no, no. Sorry for taking your time. <laughs> interesting talk, uh, talk, and for this uh, widely interesting subject, and uh, especially for the tribute to Yuri Vanishmanian, uh, who who influenced this subject else very much. Uh, okay, so thank you, so thank you very much. We, we thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.